Good morning and welcome to Sunday Worship at Grace UMC. It is wonderful to have you this morning. My name is Drew McIntyre. I'm the pastor here at Grace United Methodist Church and we're delighted to welcome you for worship on this beautiful summer Sunday morning. Especially welcome today to any guests that are with us. If you're here and you're just joining us for the first time or maybe you found us through our online ministry uh, during this season and uh, and you've only interacted with us this way, we're glad to have you this morning and, and a big welcome. Uh, and we are so glad to be with you in worship this morning. Today we're gonna continue our series, Praying with Jesus. We're looking at the Lord's Prayer and what it means for your life and, and our lives together as the people of God. Uh, we're gonna have some great music. We're gonna talk about what God is doing among us. Uh, it's gonna be a wonderful day. So thank you for joining us for worship today. Uh, today we're gonna talk about uh, the way that God provides, uh, the way that God provides in ways we would never expect, the way that God provides when we think our resources have run out. Uh, so today we're going to be talking a lot about um, bread um, and food and how God provides for from our most basic needs to our most bold uh, and powerful prayers. So we're going to start this morning with a song called Come to the Table. Uh, a good reminder that um, at the feast of God's grace, at the feast of God's welcome and hospitality, everyone is welcome. So we hope that you feel that as we worship together this morning. We all start on the outside, the outside looking in. This is where grace begins. We were hungry, we were thirsty, with nothing left to give. Oh, the shape that we were in. Just when all hope seemed lost, love opened the door for with you. You can leave it at the door. Let mercy draw you near. He said, come to the table. Come join the sinners who've been redeemed. Take your place beside the Savior. Sit down and be set free. Come to the table. To the thief and to the doubter, to the hero and the coward, to the prisoner and the soldier, to the young and to the older, all who hunger, all who thirst, all the last and all the first, all the paupers and the princes, all who fail you've been forgiven, all who dream and all who suffer, all who loved and lost another, all the chained and all the free, all who follow, all who Anyone who's been let down, all who lost you have been found, all who've been labeled right or wrong, everyone who hears the song. Set 
free. Come to the table. Awesome. Thanks so much to our musicians uh, and to James Austin for his leadership. Uh, it's exciting that we're finding new and creative ways to uh, to share our gifts together in a worship. Uh, speaking of sharing our gifts, here's some ministry opportunities that are coming up in the near future. We have our blood drive coming up on Monday, August the 10th. Um, if you got the weekly email uh, sent yesterday, then uh, you got a direct link to this. But if you uh, want to sign up, just go to oneblood.org, donate now, and then the sponsor code is there on the screen. That'll take you directly to uh, our blood drive. Of course, this is open to everyone, so please uh, tell your friends. This is just one one way that we can bless our neighbors um, uh, in this season. Uh, one Blood is the main donor for Cone Health. Uh, another opportunity to, to serve one another is simply through prayer. Um, we have a prayer and praise board now that allows you to pray for others, to see updates on prayer requests, to put your own uh, prayer needs for yourself or others. It's anonymous unless uh, you, you want to put your name on it. Um, just a, another way that we can be in prayer for uh, for one another uh, during this time. So uh, check that out. It's, it's well worth your while. We will have some fellowship uh, after worship this morning over Zoom. Um, I think Joe will probably um, give us some instructions uh, on that. Uh, we sent a link to that in yesterday's email. But uh, it'll be good to, to see, see your faces, chat a little bit. It's a pretty informal time. Uh, we just sort of catch up with each other. Um, and support one another and tell stories and, and, and it's just a good, a good opportunity for some fellowship. So we will look forward to that as well. Uh, we come now to a, to a time of prayer. Uh, Joanna is going to lead us in that, our youth pastor. Uh, we keep uh, folks in mind this season, of course, who are uh, in the medical field, um, those that are working with the sick, those who are unwell, um, those in positions of authority and leadership who are working to make decisions. Uh, we especially pray for those in our school system, um, those administrators having to make difficult decisions uh, for, for teachers and uh, all those that work in our school system and in other school systems because it's a, a difficult season. I know a lot of parents out there are, are worried and students are worried about what's going to happen this fall. So we, we bring all that to God as we worship this morning. We, we hold all that together along with the other prayer needs that you're aware of, that I'm aware of, um, those that I'm not aware of. Um, and we pray for those as well. So thanks to Joe for leading us in prayer this morning. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come to you humbly today. We give you thanks for all your many gifts and blessings. Hear our prayers, loving Lord. Hear our prayers for the sick, our prayers for the hurting, and our prayers for justice and for mercy. Forgive us for the ways we've turned away from you, God. As we worship today, we pray that you will draw near to us. We ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Joe. Uh, as we get near to our children's time, another little musical treat. Uh, this is uh, one that is probably well known to everyone, but uh, a good uh, a good piece of music as we prepare uh, for our time of children's ministry. Jesus loves me this I know. Come 
to me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me still today, walking with me on my way, wanting as a friend to give light and love to all who At one point, the great theologian Karl Barth, considered by many the greatest theologian of the 20th century, uh, was asked, after all your study, uh, after everything you've, you've learned and written, after all the lectures and sermons you've given, uh, what's the most important theological insight you have? And his response was, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Uh, awesome. Thanks to our musicians for sharing that with us. Um, speaking of gifts for the children, our Vacation Bible School is coming up August 3rd through the 6th uh, via Zoom. Um, Samantha's been in touch with, uh, uh, I think, most of our parents, but if you're new to the congregation or somehow you missed an email or just haven't seen it, uh, send her an email, send us a message on Facebook. We'll get the information to you. Uh, At-home kits will be provided for pickup next weekend. Uh, they will be safe and fun activities. Uh, it'll be a real, uh, a real enjoyable time for our children. It'll be rainforest explorers, so we're looking forward to that. Grateful to Samantha and to our Spark team for their leadership. So now we'll turn it over to Samantha, our children and families minister, and uh, then we'll have a prayer from one of our children, which has been, been a very special part of our worship during this season. Hey guys, I hope you all are doing well and that you had an awesome week and that you're enjoying your weekend um, as always with your family, um, friends, and loved ones. So today I wanted to talk to you guys about a story in the Bible and it's in the book of Matthew. And in the story, Jesus is with his disciples and they are around a crowd of people. So there's a lot of people there and Jesus tells the disciples that we're going to feed this crowd of people. And the disciples get a little nervous maybe and are like, Jesus, we don't have enough food to feed all of these people. We only have two fish and five loaves. Like, how are we going to feed all of these people? And Jesus tells the disciples to bring me what we have. Bring me the food that we have. And he lifts it up to heaven and he prays over it. And he begins to just give the food out. He gives out the two fish and the five loaves. And though it was only a little and or enough to feed him and the disciples, he multiplied it enough to where he was able to feed all of these people. And it just reminds me of how in our daily lives and in our everyday living, how Jesus takes care of us. So there may be times where we don't understand how things are going to work out or we don't understand how... Um, you know, how things even make sense. But the amazing thing about God is that he's a good father that takes care of us. And sometimes when it doesn't make sense to us, or it doesn't seem like it's going to work out, we can look to him, we can pray to him, and he will allow it to work out for us. Dear God, thank you for taking care of us. Help us to continue to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. Thanks to Wit for being our uh, our prayer this the, this week for our children's time and to Samantha. Uh, that's always a special part of our worship. Uh, thanks for everyone that is giving their gifts uh, during this time, whatever those gifts are. We're grateful as you continue to uh, send your check or have your auto draft set up or pay uh, give online. Uh, whatever it is, we're grateful for you uh, sharing your gifts, your gifts, and uh, being generous in this season. One way that you may wish to uh, to give and to be a part of our ministry is through the Ministry of Music. And so I want to share an invitation from our music director, James Austin. Good morning, everyone. If you don't know me, my name is James.
My name is Austin Brzezinski. I'm the director of music at Grace United Methodist Church in Greensboro, North Carolina. I wanted to give a shout out to all of my talented musicians in the Chancel Choir and Agents of Grace, including Faye, that you've seen during our live stream services on Sunday. They have all been working very hard to continue making our music ministry thrive and have collaborated with members in the congregation at Grace. If you're interested in singing a favorite hymn, prayer, or contemporary song, please don't hesitate to reach out to me at my email at music at grace-methodist.com. Once again, that's music at grace-methodist.com. I'm excited to continue making music at Grace with wonderful musicians, and I would love to have anybody willing to be part of that experience. Awesome. Thanks for that, James Austin. Uh, friends, let us, uh, let us pray together now uh, as, we, as we celebrate our time of offering. Let's pray. God of the desert and God of the river, you have sustained us when we could not go on. You have been faithful to us when we were unfaithful to you. Your son Jesus gave bread to the hungry, and the Spirit gives gifts to all your people. And yet too often, we see what others have and focus on what we lack. We put our hope in what does not last. We run on empty rather than walk with you. Today, like the crowds who gathered before Jesus, we're hungry for hope, for life, and for grace. Teach us to see anything offered to you is enough. Anyone who knows you has enough. And thanks to Jesus' gift, we are already enough. Amen. Amen. Ooh, and... Sorry about that. I think we had a brief disconnection, but it looks like we are back up and running. I apologize for that, um, but we will, uh, we will carry on. Uh, this morning, we are continuing our series uh, called Praying with Jesus. Um, and we are looking at, kind of step by step, looking at the Lord's Prayer. And uh, it's been a, a fun time to, uh, to just kind of uh, go through this in, in a deep way. So often we, we share the Lord's Prayer. We don't really think about it. It becomes sort of habit. And there, there's really good things about habits. Um, but it's, uh, it's a, a helpful thing, I think, to, to dig into this and, and just see how profound it really is and how transformative this prayer can be for our spiritual life. So uh, before we uh, continue that this morning, uh, let's have our scripture lesson. Uh, thanks to Katie James for reading scripture for us this morning. Uh, all the way from California, that is another gift of this season is uh, even though we are physically distanced uh, and sometimes not even in the same zip code or state, we can still worship together and even participate um, in worship together. So thanks to Katie for this. Good morning. The scripture verse for today is Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces. 12 baskets full, and those who ate were about 5,000 men besides the women and children. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God, and thank you for that reading, Katie. So we're in part three of Praying with Jesus. Since we're talking about prayer, let's pray ourselves. Let's pray. Living and loving God for this time together, for this beautiful day, uh, for the gifts that your people have shared that make this time possible. We give you thanks. Open up your word now to us uh, that this, uh, this miracle so long ago may become a living word to us uh, and sustain us and nourish us spiritually here and now today. 
And may the words I say and the meditations of all of our hearts this morning be pleasing in your sight, God, because you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So a few weeks ago, I had to cancel an order on Amazon. Uh, I had ordered this item in March and Amazon kept saying it was coming and kept saying it was coming and it never arrived. Uh, finally, I decided just to cancel the order. I didn't think it was going to come and Amazon agreed and I got my $32 back and that made me happy. But any guesses as to what I might have ordered back in March that never actually came? You might have done something similar, but what I was trying to purchase way back in March was toilet paper. This is actually the, uh, the image, hold on wait, I would make a terrible uh, weatherman. Uh, this is actually the image uh, uh, from my Amazon order of this, I don't know, random, generic, probably not even actually existing toilet paper brand that in my anxiety uh, in that season when all this began that I tried to order from Amazon. It never came, uh, but at least I got my money back. You know, um, prior to the beginning of the pandemic, I had never really experienced a shortage of anything. Uh, I'd heard grandparents talk about the, the Great Depression and read about the Victory Gardens and butter rations in World War II. I'd read about bread lines in the Soviet Union. My parents had told me about the, the gas lines in the 1970s, uh, having to wait uh, hours sometimes just to fill up the gas tank. Um, and I've never experienced anything like that. I've always been able to just get what I wanted to. And yes, that's uh, what I'm describing as a very... A privileged life, a very comfortable life. Uh, you're just describing a life of someone who, by the standards of world history, by the standards of today, the standards of sort of the, the world, um, I'm very, very well off. But I don't think I'm the only one who freaked out. Um, we, I think we all kind of collectively did this. Most of us did this. Uh, we bought up you know, desperately bought up toilet paper and other paper products. We bought up cleaning supplies. We bought up chicken as fast as we could get it and all sorts of other things. Gun sales skyrocketed. All sorts of things were immediately hoarded as the pandemic began. In our fear and anxiety, we did what perhaps we're programmed as consumers to do. We tried to buy our way out of the fear. It's not surprising that I reacted this way and maybe you reacted in a similar way. We're in a culture that teaches us scarcity every single day. All right, so I think we were sort of primed to have that reaction. Uh, think about this though. We are in a culture that teaches us that we don't have enough or that we are not enough every single day. Every single day through, uh, through advertising, through commercials, through uh, kind of celebrity culture, you're told that you don't have enough looks, you don't have enough youth, so here's a pill, here's an injection, here's a new kind of makeup, here's a diet to fix you. You're told that you don't have enough time uh, to have it all, um, that you don't uh, have an, enough uh, productivity, that you're not doing enough. So here's a new gadget, uh, a new philosophy for spending all your time. Um, here's uh, all the ways that you could be spending your time. You're told that you don't make enough money, that you don't have enough to be comfortable, um, and so here's a get rich quick scheme. This is the messages that we get every single day. I was, uh, yesterday we finished watching Hamilton for the first time, and I love how Hamilton is portrayed as this sort of quintessential uh, American, much like a 21st century American. He's idealistic, he's ambitious, he's always working like he's running out of time. Is there a better way to look at life than as a constant battle for either external or internal resources? Surely there is something better than the, the constant hamster wheel of needing to acquire more and do more and be more. What does life look like if you actually believe that there's enough? I think we get a glimpse of this in the life of Jesus. Matthew 14 tells us that uh, one day Jesus had attempted to go off by himself for some alone time. He got into a boat and went off to a deserted place, but the crowds who were following him got wind of it, and they went on foot and followed him. Jesus took pity on them and ministered to them, healing them and, 
uh, and working with him most of the day. When evening came, Jesus' disciples asked him to send the crowds away. It was dinner time. People were hungry and they should be dismissed to go find food for themselves. But Jesus instead insists that this, the disciples should give them something to eat. The disciples reply in verse 17 um, that we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. Five loaves and two fish. To the disciples, it was hardly anything. To the disciples, it was barely enough for them to get a filet of fish sandwich. It was hardly worth mentioning. But for Jesus, it was more than that. Jesus asks for it anyway. And Jesus takes the food, he blesses it, he breaks it, and he begins to give it out to the crowds and something miraculous happens. As they're, they're giving the food out, there's more and more and there's enough and they keep giving and keep giving and it never runs out. And there's so much that everyone ate until they were full and there were 12 baskets of food even left over. The disciples did not think there was remotely enough, but once they gave it to Jesus, they actually had too much. There's a beautiful lesson here, I think, for all of us, which is that in God's hands, scarcity becomes surplus. In God's hands, scarcity becomes surplus. I think this tells us something about the Lord's Prayer, that, that great prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, that, that we, that many, uh, many congregations use weekly, if not daily. Um, if you, uh, I hope you've been praying the Lord's Prayer every day. That's part of our challenge during this series, is pray that prayer every single day. Pray it in the morning when you first get up, or at night before you go to bed. Pray it as a family around the dinner table. Uh, but pray that prayer every day, and let's just see how this prayer transforms us. But I think something about um, this story of Jesus feeding the 5,000, this desire of, of Jesus to provide um, more than we could even imagine or ask for, gives us some insight into why he taught us to pray for our daily bread. Because um, I think it's really, it's really powerful. In this prayer, we pray, first of all, for God's kingdom to come. Right? We pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're praying for God's ways to prevail here and now as it does in heaven and as it will in the fullness of time. It's a prayer for uh, God's ways uh, to be true among us. It's a prayer for justice and peace, a prayer for breakthrough, a prayer for God to do a new and a powerful thing. It's a big, bold prayer. But right after that, Right after that, Jesus teaches us to pray for the most mundane and ordinary needs, for daily bread. What that means to me is that nothing is too big or too small, nothing is too grand or too simple to bring before God in prayer. Just as Jesus cared about the hungry crowds he saw, he cares about our hungers. He cares about your physical and emotional, spiritual and psychological hungers. This also reminds us that faith is not a spiritual thing. If what we mean by a spiritual thing is something detached from our bodies, from our everyday lives, from our whole selves. Jesus cared about hungry souls and hungry bodies of the people that came to him. You know, the church has often separated what Jesus held together. We separate saving souls from blessing lives. We separate spiritual insight from human rights. We separate forgiveness from spiritual healing. We separate hunger and disease uh, from physical healing and justice from mercy. Archbishop Desmond Tutu, one of the great South African church leaders who helped heal the nation after the apartheid regime fell, once said this, I don't preach a social gospel, I preach the gospel, period. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is concerned for the whole person. When people were hungry, Jesus didn't say, now is that political or social? He said, I feed you, because the good news to a hungry person is bread. I love that line. The good news to a hungry person is bread. Jesus cares about, about bodies and souls, and Jesus provides abundantly for both. In God's hands, scarcity becomes surplus. So what does it look like for us to live out this sort of faith? How do we live 
from this expectation of God's surplus rather than resigning ourselves to scarcity. A few things come to mind this morning. The first of those is generosity. Jesus multiplies what he is given. If the disciples didn't trust Jesus with the little bit that they did have, that miracle never happens. We don't become generous when we have enough. We don't wait until we win the lottery to become generous. Like the poor widow who gave only two small coins that Jesus tells about in the New Testament, uh, when those two coins were all she had, we learn that Jesus honors sacrificial giving, whether the amount is large or small. You know, your large gift is someone else's small gift. Your neighbor's small gift might be massive to you. The amount doesn't matter, but trusting God with it when it counts makes all the difference in the world. Generosity comes before the surplus, not after it. Second, and this is implied in the first, is trust. To live this way requires trust, which is another way of saying faith. This miracle doesn't happen when Jesus is well-rested and full of energy and in a generally good place. We, uh, we said at the beginning that Jesus was trying to get away from the crowds. He was trying to get some R&R. &R. He was trying to go off by himself to pray. Now, certainly this is a good thing. Jesus is a model uh, and an example of Sabbath, of, of the need for rest and refreshment and intentional time with God. And that's something that we, uh, I hope we all practice and try to have more of in our lives. But in this particular instance, Jesus didn't get his way. The crowds followed him, uh, even when he was trying to get away, and Jesus took pity on them. But do you know why Jesus was trying to get away in the first place? It, it wasn't just because he was tired from his ordinary day-to-day -day ministry. If you were to look back at the beginning of Matthew 14, you'd find the answer. Uh, what had just happened that had devastated Jesus and probably his disciples as well is that John the Baptist had just been killed. Uh, if you look back to the, uh, the early chapters in the Gospels, you recall that John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin, um, that Jesus' mama and John the Baptist's mama were pregnant at the same time. They had literally known each other from the time they were born. And John's ministry, John's calling, was to prepare the way for Jesus. So they were not only related, they were not only friends, but their ministries were intimately tied together. And just before this scene, just before this miracle, Jesus gets the devastating news that his cousin, his friend, his fellow worker for God had been brutally and shockingly killed. And so Jesus is tired. Jesus uh, wants to rest and to pray, um, but he's pursued by the crowds. And even though he's got grief, even though he's tired, even though he wants some downtime, he chooses in that moment to serve others instead. What I take from that is that sometimes that miraculous multiplication, it comes at the end of our resources. This provision of, of daily bread, it doesn't come when Jesus is at 100%. It comes when he is drained. It comes when he is zapped. I'm sure someone who's watching this right now is feeling a similar way. Maybe you're concerned in the season about making ends meet. Maybe your job has been affected uh, by uh, the pandemic and the shutdown. Maybe you're worried about what's going to happen with school in the fall and how you're going to juggle um, your, your kids' schoolwork and, and work and the other th responsibilities and things you have to do. Maybe someone watching this right now just has a bunch of things going on on top of the pandemic. People you love are hurting, relationships are frayed, whatever it is, and and you're concerned if you can keep going. And I'm not here to tell you that you can make it on your own. That's the whole point of this miracle. The miracle comes when Jesus is, t is tired, when he's beat, when he's about through. But what he does is he takes what he has on hand. He takes the little bit that he has and he asks God to bless it. And it becomes enough. We're talking here about heavenly resources about divine intervention because grace is the opposite of self-help. When you're at the end of your rope, ask for grace, ask for God's help, ask for God to show up. Trust that God will take the little fish you have, the little loaf you have, 
and make it enough to meet your needs. Because God's resources show up often when our resources are drained. In God's hands, scarcity becomes surplus. Imagine what a community that trusted in surplus over scarcity would look like. I think it'd be a, a community of people who lived from trust, who gave what they had to God and trusted that it was enough, who lived from the grace of a generous God and not as consumers who can never be satisfied. That was another Hamilton reference. It would be a people who weren't anxious to acquire more, but who trusted that their, their small gifts, their large gifts, their talents, their time, their prayers, their hope, their acts of service and justice, that they trusted those to a God who can do far and above what we could imagine with those offerings. If you were to visit an Eastern Orthodox church on a typical Sunday and you saw the bread at communion time, and in Orthodox churches every Sunday is communion time, uh, you would notice an interesting imprint on the bread. It looks something like this. You'd see a, a cross and uh, on the four corners of the cross, uh, four sets of Greek letters. On the top, um, the IC and the XC are the first Greek letters of the name Jesus Christ. The bottom uh, four words, uh, four letters, form the word Nika, which is sort of close to Nike. If you wear Nike, uh, Nike shoes, Nike was the goddess of uh, victory um, in the ancient world. Nika is a similar word. Nika means conquers. So on their communion bread is written, Jesus Christ conquers. There's a, a little better look at what that symbol might look like. Jesus Christ conquers. This is a God who conquers not with armies or force of law, not in a voting booth or not with an atom bomb, but by offering himself like bread for sacrifice. Just as Jesus uh, took, blessed, broke, and gave the bread and fish that day to the hungry people. Jesus' ultimate act of love was when he was taken by soldiers, broken on the cross. He blessed those who killed him even as he was dying, and he gave himself up for the life of the world. That same series of actions, take and bless, break and give, is how we celebrate communion to this day. It's also a model for how God receives our humble gifts. Friends, whatever you have to give to the work of Jesus, whatever, whatever time, whatever calling on your heart, whatever way you want to serve your neighbors, uh, whatever uh, musical ability or other gift you have to the work of God, you might be convinced that it's not much, that it's not worth sharing, that it's not worth naming. You might be convinced that someone like you can offer nothing to God, but you'd be wrong. In God's eyes, the little that we have is just a feast waiting to be multiplied. Because whatever we offer to God in trust is taken, is blessed, is broken open, and shared in ways that we cannot imagine. And so to this generous God, we pray for daily bread. We pray for the simplest things, as well for the, the full grandeur of God's kingdom. We don't hesitate for, to ask for anything, large or small. We don't hesitate to give anything, large or small, because this is a God that cares for the great and the small alike. This is a God who makes rivers in the desert, a God who rains manna from the heaven when his people are hungry. This is a God who brings life out of death. And with that kind of God, no prayer is wasted. No gift is too small. No life is insignificant. If it is given over and trust that God's, in God's kingdom, there is always enough. And that when, as we serve in God's kingdom, you and I are enough. In God's hands, scarcity becomes surplus. Let's pray. Living and loving God, we give you thanks for this time. We give you thanks that your son still works miracles among us that when we think we have too little, when we think we can't hang on, that when we think we are at the end of our resources, that your divine assistance, your grace, your mercy shows up. So God, help us to see where we don't have eyes. 
Help us to hear where we don't have ears. Help us to hope where our hope has faded. Because we can't do this on our own, but we were not meant to. For you would seek to guide us, to lead us, and to take the little fish we have, the little loaves that we have, and turn it into a kingdom feast. So God, be with us this day and as we move forward. In this strange season, season in this uh, world of disease and injustice, in this world of uncertainty and anxiety, teach us to rely not on our resources, but on your resources. And all God's people said, amen. Friends, it's not, it's not because everything is yet as it should be that we can have joy in the Lord. It's not because everything is, is perfect yet that we can sing praises to God. It's not because the kingdom is here in its fullness that, uh, that we can smile. And yet, with the glimpses of the kingdom that we do get, and yet with the testimonies that we have, uh, both from, uh, from ourselves, from our congregation, from so many other corners of the world about God's provision, uh, we do dare to say, it is well with my soul. We're going to close with that song now.
thank you uh, for that wonderful reminder uh, that God brings peace even when we don't expect it uh, in this particular season. Uh, so friends, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for making time, whether you're watching this live or, or later in the day or later in the week. I know people are traveling a lot in the summer. Uh, thank you for making worship a priority. Um, thank you for taking that time uh, to, to spend with God, to spend with uh, the community in this way. Thanks to all those that have made this morning possible. We will have some Zoom fellowship here in just a minute. Uh, I hope you'll join us for that. That'll be a good time. Let me send you off with a blessing. Let me go forth from this time and this place, remembering that our resources are not enough, but that the God who loves us, the God of all grace and mercy, uh, the God whose kingdom is coming in even now makes it enough because God loves us, God cares for us, and God takes those little loaves and fishes that we have and makes them enough. In God's hands, scarcity becomes surplus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.